Welcome to our study. It's really a, a joy to see you. We are studying at this time uh, the, the American home, the world home uh, throughout the world because uh, things are not different. Uh, Germany has the same problems America has. South Africa has the same problems America has. France has the same problems. Japan has the same problems. It isn't a, a local situation. Uh, it is a world situation that we're dealing with. Living a happy ever after simply means this, that when you're married, <laughs> you don't have to go into a tailspin. And, and you often wonder how so much love could turn to so awful hate, you know? Uh, tearing each other to pieces and hating one another when they had loved and thought it was a dream that, wouldn't, that would never end. And that's what we want you to enjoy. Uh, we believe that you can enjoy life. We believe that it can be great. And we just want you to have the very fullness of it. And, and today, especially if you're a mother-in-law, you're going to really like this program. <laughs> so we want you to come with us. We'll go over and join Louise, and we'll talk together over here about this, tre tre this tremendous subject. Uh, Mommy, did you ever think when you were growing up that you would ever be a mother-in-law? <laughs> I tell you, that I, didn't come to you, huh? I guess I was so busy, I didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, it kind of slips up on you, doesn't uh, uh -huh. it? It sounds much you, nicer you when read you about, say a mother than a mother-in-law. Yeah, just, you, 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 you read about mothers-in-law and, you know, and all of that and, I know, and, and, you, I and hear, all the, hear all the uh, terrible stories about mothers-in-law, but when you finally become one, it's another story, you know? Well, that's right, and I think it's very wrong that they have uh, slanted it that way. There might be some occasions, but I've known of uh, a lot of mothers than, that are mother-in-laws and they have a beautiful relationship with their daughter-in-laws. Isn't that great? Or their son-in-laws. Oh, their son-in-laws. Isn't that fine? Uh, in this special uh, series of, uh, of lessons about the home, we began with the birth of the human family, what is family life anyway, the three worlds of marriage, the right relationship between, a men, between men and women, the unfaithful wife, the unfaithful father-in-law, the king's stepdaughter, which was still dealing with unfaithfulness, and then uh, prophetically seven women holding on to one man. And now we're talking about the greatest mother-in-law in history. Now that might be stretching it a little bit, uh, but she was certainly a great mother-in-law, and we're going to get into that. And then in our next lesson, we're going to deal with America's 3,000 divorce courses. Of uh, course, you will certainly uh, appreciate that, America's 3,000 divorce courts. And then We've got a series of lessons that you're truly going to enjoy called 10 Family Hurdles, 10 Principles of Marital Bliss, and the 10 Deadless Destroys of Living Happy Ever After. And the final lesson uh, for this time, we may start over again soon, uh, but uh, the final lesson is, has to do with protecting your home. You know, uh, we protect everything we have with insurance, but one thing you can't get insurance for, and that's keeping your wife. I <laughs> had never heard of that insurance yet. And, and, and so that's an area where you are responsible and God helps and the devil destroys. And so we have to keep the thing straight and, and, and let's do it. We certainly want America's homes to stay together, don't we, Mom? We certainly do. Yeah. Uh, in this day and age, it can be one of the great bulwarks against the onslaughts of the enemy. That's right. And uh, those of the world can look at the families and see how happy they are and how they are adjusted to each other and it can be a real testimony. If you'd open your, uh, your Bibles to the book of Ruth, uh, the book of Ruth is a very e exciting uh, book. It's, it's the eighth book of the Bible, and, and that speaks to us of resurrection, of course. It's right between the book of Judges and, and, and the book of 1 Samuel here, and in both of them they had a lot of wars, and so it's a little haven uh, right in the middle of a lot of trouble. And it's always nice to get a hold of something like that. And verse 1, if you'd open your Bible to the book of Ruth, in verse 1 it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, so it gives you the time period there during the time of the judges, that there was a famine in the land. They often seemed to have famines in those days. They didn't know how to control their water. They didn't know how to control their, 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 their land reforms. And so they had a famine, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, uh, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And, and so there were four of them that went uh, from Bethlehem uh, down, down through the valley there of the, uh, where the Dead Sea is and up the other side into the hills of Moab uh, that they might live in Moab. Once you get up on top of the hills of big plateaus and nice place to live, of course. And Elimelech uh, was the name of the man and his wife was named uh, Naomi. They had two sons. One was named Malon, M-A-H-L-O-N, and the other was named Kilian. 
and uh, they, they departed and migrated uh, from Bethlehem of Judah and went across to live in a, in a heathen land. Uh, I, I don't think it was the right thing to do. I think they should have stayed there and prayed and, and worked on their own land, but they, nevertheless, because of a drought, I presume, uh, they went across and, uh, and lived in this new land. And when they got over there, they were only there for 10 years altogether. When they got over there, we don't know exactly how long it took, but in verse 3, so it didn't take long, beginning in verse 1, right down in verse 3, we find that Elimelech died in that land of Moab. He died. So they, the, the, the main thrust of the one, and the one, no doubt the one that made the decision to go over there, he died. Uh, but uh, their, their two sons uh, married while they were over there, and, and they married uh, two Moab girls. And I'd just like to tell you something real straight. Your kids will marry the people you hang around. Now, I've lived on the mission field, and I have discovered that uh, missionaries' children will, will marry South Americans. They, they'll, they'll marry Africans. They'll marry Chinese. They'll marry, they'll marry whoever you stay around. And it's just a, a natural situation uh, that they'll do it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I know what I'm talking about. They will, they will live with the people that you l teach them to live around. And, and so if you don't want your children to marry the local culture, then you have to send them back to school to their homeland or leave them there to go to school until after they're married for them to become missionaries. But uh, no matter how much Eliminate wanted his, his two sons, uh, Malon and, and Killian, to, to marry girls from, from Bethlehem and girls that knew the Jehovah God, they didn't. They married Moabitish girls, uh, which were pagans, and they, uh, and they worshiped idols. One was named Orpah, O-R-P-A-H, and the other was named Ruth. Now, the word Orpah means double-minded, and I think you see that in this girl all the way through, uh, th through her life. The word Ruth means fullness, and I believe you can see that. Sometimes, in a most unexpected place, you can find the nicest people. You certainly can. <laughs> Sometimes, it's just amazing how uh, right in the place where you don't expect to find beauty, uh, it begins to flourish there. And that's true of this girl named Ruth, whose name means uh, fullness. Now, they lived in this land of Moab for 10 years. And in verse 5, that's in verse 4, by the way, if you're following me in the Word. In verse 5, uh, we, we find that Malan and, and, and Kilian also died, uh, leaving a widowed mother and two widowed wives with no children. And it looks as if it could have been a sudden kind of a thing because they didn't have any children. The, the men didn't give any children to the women. And so now they had three women left. You had a mother and, and two widowed wives. And, and so now you, you've got a mother-in-law and two daughters-in-law. And so Naomi uh, said, well, wait a minute here. I came over here with a husband. I came over here with two sons. Now I have nothing, nothing. I better go home. Uh, and that was 10 years. It took 10 years to come to nothing. And so she said, I'll go home. So she took the daughters-in-law and, and said to them, won't you please uh, remain in Moab? That's in verse 8. says, won't you please do it? says, you are Moabitess, and uh, our, your husbands are dead. I, I, I am so old, I can never give you another son. And, and, uh, and a husband can't produce a son for you, a husband. And even if I could, you wouldn't wait for him. And that's in the Bible, too. And so when she told them that, the one named Orpah, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the one that the Bible says that her name means double-minded. She kissed her mother-in-law and returned to her paganism and to her heathen people. Now, you'll, you'll find people like that in the world. Uh, they, they, they have some affection, <laughs> but that's as, far, that's as far as the affection goes, right there. Uh, here she says, yes, I love my mother-in-law. I'll go back and worship my idols uh, that have eyes and can't see and ears that can't hear, and they're, they, they're dumb idols. I'll go back and worship my idols now. Uh, you know, they are double-minded. Uh, when they're with you, they're one thing. When we're with somebody else, they're something else. And when she was with her mother-in-law, oh, yes, I believe in Jehovah. She got back with the others, oh, yes, I believe, I, I believe in worship Baal, and, and I believe in worshiping these other gods. She was double-minded. But Ruth... Ruth, you find here a, a different kind of a person. At this point, we, we observed uh, the greatest mother-in-law uh, that we know about in the Bible, the greatest mother-in-law. Uh, she showed how a daughter-in-law can love a mother-in-law and how a mother-in-law can love 
a daughter in law. So let's look at it real straight. Number one, uh, Ruth was, was a foreigner uh, to the people of Israel. She was a Moabitess. And uh, she was reared as an idol worshiper. She, from babyhood, that's all that she knew. And, and so Ruth uh, uh, suddenly said, You know, I don't want to go back and be what I was. I love you. Now, that mother in law had instilled something in her to make this. She made a seven-point declaration. If you want to follow me in it, uh, we will work on it together. That's in Ruth chapter 1 and verse, beginning in verse 15. Uh, she, made, she made seven points in her declaration to her and, and to her mother. Now, Naomi, the mother-in-law said, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Now, that, that's, that's right there in verse 15. She went back to her people and her gods. She, she, she forsook the true religion. There are people that know the way to heaven and don't take it. There are people that know the way to God and don't receive it. Uh, uh, so she went back to her gods. says, now, will you return after your sister-in-law? And that's when this young Moabitess named Ruth made a seven-point declaration. She said, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you. Now, what she said very shortly was, she says, uh, uh, shut up. I am not going back. I've made up my mind. So stop talking about it. Stop discussing the matter. You know, that's very good. When you don't want to do something, don't talk about it. Don't keep rehearsing it. If you do, you might find yourself weakened in another moment that you don't have the strength you had at that moment. So get it out of you. And that's what she said. She said, now, nah, 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 mom, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say something. Listen to me. Leave me alone. I am not going to leave you, and I'm not going to stop following after you. It says, now, that's the way it is. And then she made her second declaration. She said, where you go, I'll go. You see? And uh, <laughs> that was pretty straight, wasn't it? That had the four points of the compass right there. If you go west, I go west. If you go east, I go east. If you go north, I go north. If you go south, I go. Where you go, I go. Now, now that was uh, an, an, an amazing devotion between two that they only had a marriage relationship, you see. Uh, and they were two people from two different nations. They were not the same blood uh, of people. Uh, this, this Moabitess had learned to love a mother-in-law uh, that was an Israeli with an intensity that the whole world stands amazed at it even unto this moment. She says, now I want to tell you something. Don't be telling me to leave you anymore. Where you go, I will go. Number three, in her declaration, she said, where you lodge, I will lodge. You see, if we make it to a palace, well, bless God, I'll live with you in a palace. <laughs> That's not hard. And, uh, and, and says, if, if we make it in a hovel, I'll live with you in a hovel. If we have to live in a tent, then we'll live in a tent together. But says, I want you to know something. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. And, and I want to tell you something better than that. I won't ever live any better than you do. And I won't ever live any worse than you do either. But I won't ever live any better than you do. If I find a man, he's going to have to take us both in, and you're going to be elevated just like I am. He says, now, I want, to, I want you to know I'm going to lodge where you lodge. And then her fourth statement was tremendous. She said, your people shall be my people. Now, that's devotion for you. Now, only a certain woman uh, could make a person so devoted to them. Uh, she had brought something into that girl's heart that said, I'm going to emulate you, and your people will be my people. I will no longer be a foreigner. I will be your people. They shall be my people, and we're going to be one people together. You know, that's the way to have a happy home. That's the way. When, when, you, when you have contrariness in the home and and, and you have distances between us, and you have the high and the low, you don't have a happy home. A happy home is when your people are my people. You know, you're one people. They're together in that home. Your people should be my people. And then her fifth statement that she made was that she said, your God will be my God. <laughs> That's in the area of spirit. Now, if, if, you want, if you want to have a happy home, you have to serve the same Lord. Uh, most of the problems in our homes in America are spiritual. Either you don't pray together as you should, you don't read the Bible together as you should, or one of you loves God and the other hates God. 
and, and some of you men out there ought to be taken out and spanked by somebody. You try to keep your wife from going to church, and I've got news for you, and I'm going to teach it in another lesson here, that you have no right to keep your wife away from God, nor your children either. Your rights end because there are transcending laws in the universe. You better write that down. There are transcending laws in the universe, and when you step into the spiritual, you have lost your rights. You say, why? Because a greater law has just taken over, the law that is supreme throughout the whole universe. Now, you better remember that because it's worth, it is worth remembering. But she said, your God shall be my God. They were not only going to be united uh, and, and, and their work, where you go, I'll go, and their lodging, where you lodge, I will lodge, your people will be my, I'm going to be more than just your people. I'm going to be a spiritual asset with you. Your God will be my God. We're going to flow together when we sing. We're going to flow together when we pray. We're going to go to the synagogue together. We're going to worship God together. Your God's my God. She had deserted the, the gods of stone and the gods of mud and, and the gods of wood, and she had said, I'm going to serve the true and the living God. What a decision she made. That was her fifth statement. Her sixth was, and this is great too, she says, now listen, where you die, I will die, and I will be buried there. I will be buried there. So many people want to go back home. I found some of the most interesting situations. We're almost like wild geese, you know, the whole of the human race. Did you know we like to go back and die where we were born? Hey, just like a salmon going back upstream, uh, you know, out in British Columbia or up in Alaska. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. My wife and I met a, a Swedish, I mean, a, a Swiss family out in, uh, out in the Philippines, and they owned a tremendous found, a found, a plantation of, uh, of, of all kinds of wonderful things out there, including uh, pineapples and, and uh, all, all kinds of fruits. And was, he was very wealthy. And he came up to Manila and saw us, and he says, I, I sold the whole thing. And I said, why? He said, I'm going back to Switzerland to die. <laughs> I think my eyes a couple of times. He said, I want to be buried in Switzerland. I don't want to be buried in Mindanao. And, and so he, he lived there all, almost all of his life from a boy. And uh, he was a very wealthy man. The country had served him well, but he wanted to go to Switzerland to die. Uh, and she said, where you die, I'll die. And I'll be buried there. And they won't be shipping my bones back. I won't ever be a Moabitess. Where you, where you die, I'll die. Where you're buried, I'll be buried. And then her last statement was, says, The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Isn't there something? She says, Let God's judgments come against me, if anything but death come against me. And so these two came to Israel to live. And uh, in chapter 3 there, in verse 2, it tells how Ruth and Boaz met in chapter 1, and, and I mean, in chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 2. And uh, how the mother in, in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 3 told her, he says, now go wash yourself and, and go uh, uh, change uh, your, your garments and go and anoint yourself. Now, th this was a mother-in-law talking to her, her little daughter-in-law. says, now, I'll tell you how to get this man. You get this man by washing yourself and, and, uh, and, and being real clean and pretty and changing your clothes and, and by putting perfume on <laughs> And he says, now, that's the way to get him. And he says, now, I, I want you to do that. But Boaz had already been busy watching this young lady. And so he, he noticed that she was very diligent in her labor. And he said, uh, I, I like that. that. That woman is a worker. And there were three things that he said about her. Uh, he said, I also noticed that she dearly loved her mother-in-law. And he says, I like that kind of a woman. People love people that make love. People love lovers. People do not love haters. Haters can turn their hate any direction they want to. Hate is a deadly, is a deadly venom. And uh, if you've got hate in your heart, you've got trouble in your heart. He saw how she loved her. And then she saw, he, the, he saw that she didn't play around with the, with the young men. She wasn't out for a gay time. She wasn't out for a lot of fun. Uh, in Ruth chapter 4, if you'd like to open your Bible there for a moment, uh, beginning in verse 9 of Ruth chapter 4, it says, Boaz said unto the elders and to all the people, you are my witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilian's and Malin's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malan, have I purchased to be my wife. 
to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. And ye are witnesses this day. And he said, and all the people that were in the gate and the elders in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is to come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which, which too did build the house of Israel and do thou worthily in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. And so uh, uh, here was a, a man that went before the elders of the city and he says, I will receive all the responsibilities of this dead man and, and his two sons and, and, and of, the, of, the, of the mother-in-law and of the daughter. I accept her in, in marriage. And you know what he had to do? He took off a shoe and handed it in. They, they, they proved uh, their contracts with a shoe. And so the, he took the shoe and, and handed it in. And he became, and he became the, uh, the, the husband of this girl. Now you had a happy, happy mother-in-law because fairly soon she was holding a little baby in her arms. And, and so she got to be, to, to know and to love a little child again. And her, her, her daughter became a, a, famous, a famous woman because uh, she gave birth uh, to Obed, and Obed gave birth to Jesse, and Jesse gave birth to David, and David sat upon the throne of Israel, and uh, David became one of the greatest, one of the greatest persons that ever lived in Israel, and his grandmother, his grandmother was a Moabitess that made those seven tremendous statements favoring her mother-in-law. So that makes this mother-in-law one of the most outstanding mother-in-laws in the world when she had nothing uh, through helping and blessing and loving and caring for her daughter-in-law. Uh, she herself stepped into the royal lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. She herself became uh, a great grandma of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Jesse and a great, great grandma of David. And so uh, it's amazing how she that had nothing received everything. She had fullness. She had everything. She had love. Uh, she had plenty of wealth. She had everything because she loved her daughter-in-law. I want to tell you, homes can be happy. Why should you hate a girl simply because she was reared in another home? Why should you hate your mother-in-law simply because she's not your real mother? You know, if you take things at their base and face value and love one another, you'd be so happy on the face of this earth. We can hold our families together in love, and we want you to love one another. Little mother-in-law, what do you think of that? Oh, I think that's a beautiful story. There's no other better in the Bible, in the entire Bible, that's a, a good illustration for anybody, whether they're converted to Christ or whether they're of the world. There it tells just how you should react to your Knowing the family. inside of our family, Louise has sought to be a real wonderful mother-in-law. When we go off anywhere, she buys, she buys presents for those daughters and for their grandchildren. And when she comes back, she's so glad to see them and to be with them that she has been a real Christian mother-in-law. She's like Naomi. And she has fullness. She has fullness of joy. She has fullness of comfort uh, because she has been, uh, number one, a clean girl. And she's, number two, a, a beautiful wife and a great mother and now a, a lovely mother-in-law and grandmother. And that's what makes the world go around. That's what makes life worth living. That's what's gonna make eterni eternity beautiful. And both of us would like to recommend it to you. Isn't that right? It certainly <laughs> is. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. We certainly want you to have it and to enjoy it. May we bless you. We're gonna believe God together. Lord bless the mother-in-laws today. They, they seem to be pushed around sometimes and, and hurt and spoken against. And, and so we say bless them. Uh, teach them to be a, a Naomi. Teach them to read the book of Ruth and to see how a famous mother-in-law made it and see how she, he, she actually cared for her daughters-in-law just like her sons. <clears throat> and that when she lost her sons, uh, she, she continued uh, with her daughters-in-law and that she provided for them. She found them the right kind of a companion and she stuck right with them uh, all the way through. And so, Lord, give us families like that that stick together that don't fight each other. It's wrong for families to fight internally. 
and uh, for them to resolve their own problems. They, they don't need to go to all kinds of psychologists and psychiatrists and lawyers and so forth. Help them that in their own home, that love will precede everything, and giving to one another will precede everything, and there should be peace in every home. And Lord, we want everyone to live happily ever after.